Good afternoon, everyone, and a very happy Thursday afternoon to you all, when no, ma no matter where you are joining us from today. It's great that you're joining us for another Thursday lunchtime lecture from the Church's Conservation Trust. And this week, we've got a real treat in store for you, because we've not got one, but we've got two fantastic lecturers lined up for you. As is always the case, um, we dedicate the first 10 minutes of these um, lectures to what we call Church of the Week, where we explore one of the 356 churches in our care, which normally in some way has a link to today's lecture. Um, so today I'm going to quickly pass you over to Peter Ayres, and he's going to introduce this week's Church of the Week. Thank you, George, and hello to everyone who's joining us uh, for this. Uh, as usual, you'll notice me fumbling around to share my screen, which has become a time-honoured tradition. Uh, let's see if we can get it right. OK, uh, there we go. I hope you can see my screen now. So, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank Ecclesiastical Insurance for sponsoring Church of the Week and giving their support to our programme of lunchtime lectures. Now, today's church is one that made it into our care in 1979 and it's one which has seen substantial conservation work carried out at it just this year and it's St Lawrence's Church Evesham in Worcestershire and as you can see it is an extremely grand church indeed. The church was first mentioned in 1195 and built for those living on the west side of the town. It enjoyed a special relationship with the Benedictine Abbey which is situated just east of the church. St Lawrence's appears to have been rebuilt about 1295 and again in about 1540. But the Abbey's dissolution in 1540 reduced the church's fortune so that by 1659 the parish had no clergy and was served by the vicars of All Saints next door, how the mighty have fallen. Here you can see the great Abbey gate that survived the dissolution of monasteries at Evesham and you might just be able to make out the chancel of All Saints in the bo bottom right hand corner. St Lawrence's fell into a state of decay after 1659 and in 1718 it was stated that the church was virtually unusable in winter. However, a new vicar was appointed in 1735 and repairs were put in hand involving the demolition of the North Arcade and raising the walls of the North Isle with a new roof spanning nave and aisle. But this new roof soon collapsed and the building became derelict and disused. In 1836 to 37, under the patronage of Edward Rudge, a thorough restoration was carried out by the architect uh, Harvey Eggington. The North Isle was remodelled and the new North Arcade built and new furnishings added. The church is entered through the west door of the tower. The tower and spire date from the 15th century. As in All Saints, the base of the tower forms the west porch. The stone vault above the first stage of the tower is by Eggington. The stone screen above the inner door into the church was added by Eggington. The organ and the choir occupied the gallery at the first floor level until 1874. Now, in this photograph, you can see the stone screen under the tower in much better detail. I should mention that the light inside the church is particularly splendid. You can see from those clear glass glazing uh, points. As with many of our churches, St Lawrence's has some fine stained glass, particularly in the chancel. In brilliant colours they depict, as you can see here in the north chancel window, Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac, Samson carrying the, the gates of, of Gaza, and David displaying Goliath's huge head. These were created by Alexander Gibb, Gibbs in 1864. Here is a close-up of David holding Goliath's huge head. The South Chapel was originally built as a chantry for Abbot Clement Litchfield in the early 16th century, and it has a fine fan vaulting with stone niches and panels below the windows. The fan vaulting at Evesham is truly, as you can see from this photograph, something very special. On the North Isle can be seen this stone carving. It depicts a green man and was discovered in 1931 and was probably once part of the monument to Thomas Newbold, Abbot of Evesham, 1491 to 1513. I mentioned at the start of the Church of the Week that Evesham had benefited from substantial conservation work this year, following the 2017 condition survey and a major fall of stone in 2018. A rope access determined 
a, a inspection, sorry, a rope access inspection, which is where someone does what it says, hangs off a rope and goes down the side of the building, uh, determined that major repairs to the tower and spire stonework at high level were needed. Last year, we were very grateful to be awarded £1.3 million from the government's one point um, from the government's cultural recovery fund uh, for conservation work at 18 of our churches. Evesham secured well over £200,000 and with some of our own money we were able to afford to scaffold the tower and carry out these much needed repairs and we we're very grateful for that funding from the government and from Historic England. Repair and conservation work also included work to the much defaced relief of the crucifixion which is believed to have survived from the original church. This tower is built from lyre stone, which is, in inverted commas, a problematic stone in the conservation world. Where we were unable to conserve existing lyre, new stone had to be brought in. But the entire, the entire tower has been repointed with new lime mortar, which is a fundamental part of building conservation because it allows the stone to breathe uh, and, and keeps the water out. This work was painstakingly carried out by wonderful skilled heritage craftspeople and without such skills conserving historic buildings would become increasingly challenging. That's why the focus of our annual appeal this year is all about supporting heritage craft skills and please do take a look at our website and learn more about it and more so please contribute uh, because your donations really support the work of the Church's Conservation Trust. Back to you George. Thank you so much, Peter. So um, we've got a bit of time, um, a couple of minutes, Peter, for some questions. But um, one of the things I wanted to quickly do is thank everyone who supported me and my colleague, um, Shana James, last weekend for Ride in Stride. Um, so this is an annual event that takes place across the country every year on the second Saturday in September. And for the first time, CCT entered a team. And so we cycled around my home county of Suffolk. And we, in the end, we cycled 41 miles and we visited 21 churches raising money um, for churches in the care of the Church Conservation Trust, but also um, for churches that would benefit from funding from the Suffolk Historic Churches Trust. Thank you so much for all the tweets, everyone, and particularly thank you to everyone who has donated. Um, if you haven't donated, there is still some time, um, and we'll, I'll post a link on the chat. So if you'd like to make a donation, um, please do consider making a donation towards our Ride and Stride. Um, every pound really does matter. Now, Peter, I know you've been incredibly busy. Um, obviously, you've come back from holiday, you've been on jury service, but do you want to give people just a flavour of some of the projects you've been involved with and um, some of the activities we're taking on at the Church Conservation Trust prop at the moment? Well, it's a, <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer. I think it's an ongoing uh, sort of struggle to balance. Well, it's not a struggle, it's a joy actually, uh, to balance all of the things that the Trust tries to do. And we're involved in all sorts of things from, you know, very importantly, the repair and maintenance of uh, historic church buildings across the country to identifying new ones that may be coming to the Trust shortly. We never know, we might be giving you some information about that at some point very soon. And also the activities that we undertake to engage communities uh, in the work that we do. Um, and it's been a, a real joy to be part of this. Um, I was up in St. Bree at the weekend, last weekend, to go and see uh, where there'd been a festival all weekend. And the local community came together, had lots of uh, music and arts events, uh, based around some of it based around Shakespeare. And they raised loads of money. And I was there on Sunday morning for a uh, service with the church was full. Uh, and it was a real pleasure to be able to talk a bit more about the Church's Conservation Trust. The other thing that's going really well this year at the moment, and I'm very excited about, and I'm sure you've heard of it before, is Champing, jamping.co.uk. You can still go. We're running the season into October, so uh, there's still a chance to make a booking uh, to do that if you haven't done it. It really has been the call of the summer. Uh, it might be related to the fact that people couldn't go away abroad this year, but really people have embraced this uh, experience of having a, uh, a beautiful historic church building all to yourself 
uh, overnight. Uh, it's, there's nothing like it. I mean, it is a quite an incredible experience. The other exciting thing that's going on at the moment is the government spending review. Uh, maybe not as much excitement for everybody as to me, but it does make, make a difference because we are generously funded by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. And so what the government decided to settle on that department doesn't have an impact on us. So we've been making a good case for why we're worth continuing to support for the good work that we do saving historic churches on behalf of the nation really so apart from that there's been senior management team meetings there's a board meeting next week uh, all the thrilling excitement of uh, the governance of, uh, of a charity so um and if that's not too exciting a point to leave you on i'll go back to you there george thanks peter so um, everyone as you can see we've been really busy but um we will keep you updated especially with news about any potential new vestings that are coming our way so um we're about to start the lecture everyone but thank you so much for joining i see we've got people from across the world so um a warm welcome to everyone if this is your first time especially do let us know um but do everyone let us know where you're joining us from today um but thank you for joining us as always these lectures are free of charge so if you see anyone posting with any links telling you to watch the lecture elsewhere please don't click those links and please don't give anyone your card details these lectures are always free of charge and the recordings are available also free of charge on our youtube channel and also on our facebook now if you're enjoying these lectures and i've just posted details of um, the upcoming lectures for the next few weeks, um, please do consider supporting us. Now you can do that in a couple of ways. You can de text donate. So you can text CCT to 70331 and that will give us a gift of uh, three pounds. Um, but you can also um, donate through our website, which is um, www visitchurches.org.uk and you can learn about um, not only all the churches that I care but also about our conservation philosophy and also exciting events taking place but also you can take advantage of our membership offer so um, our membership starts from just £3.50 a month and if you join um, as a member by direct debit and if you use the offer code lecture and that's the word lecture in capitals you will get a free copy of this book um, which is the secret language of cathedrals and churches written by a previous lunchtime lecturer of ours, Dr. Richard Stemp. Now, for those of you who are joining us about vaulting today, it has a section dedicated there. You can see the cloisters there um, of, which I believe is Gloucester where they filmed Harry Potter. Um, it's a great book. And I know that lots of people have really enjoyed reading this. So if you've enjoyed reading it, do let us know. Um, but there's also lots of other benefits of um, being a member with us. You get um, regular updates from us at the Trust. You get a, a members magazine called Pinnacle sent you a couple of times a year, um, as well as invitations to exclusive events and also invitations to our exclusive, um, exclusive member lecture series that we started a few months ago and which um, Nick, um, who's talking today to you all, um, kindly did a lecture for us with. If you've got any technical problems or any questions, please do comment away or send us a direct message on Facebook and either myself or my team will um, get back to you. But that's enough from me um, so far. So I'm going to pass you back to Peter and we're going to start the lecture very shortly. Thank you, George. Um, I've just I've just sort of been listening and realised that we just keep asking you all for money all the time with uh, three different ways we did that then. Uh, but I was going to say uh, that what, what really helps more than anything is if you become a member of the CCT. Uh, all those other ways are really great as well. Uh, we are really grateful for every donation, but becoming a member means that you bind yourself to the organisation and what we do and we give you great opportunities and this week's I must say this week's members only lecture was outstanding obviously it wasn't as good as Nick's because uh, he's here and he'll hear what I'm saying but it was really really good um, uh, and all about all souls uh, all saints in Cambridge which is one of our one of our particular churches and, and the quality magazine pinnacle is 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 a huge value so we're lucky as we've said to have two lecturers with us today so let me first introduce Dr Alex Buchanan who's a senior lecturer in archive studies at the University of Liverpool, having previously been an archivist for the, the, the Cloth Workers Company and Lambeth Palace Library in London. Alex's research is situated at the intersection between archives and architectural history. She's interested in how medieval architecture was designed, communicated and recorded, and how it has been studied in the post-medieval period. In 2013, Alex published a monograph on the subjects of Robert Willis, 1800 to 1875, and the foundation of architectural history. 
a pioneering architectural historian whose work on vaults, which you'll notice is a theme for today, inspired both her initial interest in him and the present medieval vaults project, which she co-leads alongside handily Dr. Nick Webb, who's the second person I'm going to introduce today. So Nick, um, as, as I said before, has done one of our lectures for members only before, is a qualified architect and lecturer at the Liverpool School of Architecture. And as a researcher, he's interested in how digital tools and techniques can be used as methods to enhance and critique our understanding of historic works of architecture, whether they be existing buildings, were built and then damaged or destroyed, or were not built at all. His research focuses on methods that enable new information to be provided that would not have been possible in the pre-digital context, including digital capture technologies such as laser scanning, three-dimensional digital modeling, analysis, and immersive virtual reality techniques. He is Mr. Architectural Tech, I suppose is probably a good way of summing that up. Um, he's currently co-leading Tracing the Past, analyzing the design and construction of English medieval vaults using digital techniques. So all the things we love, technology and medieval architecture. Rec then this research project is alongside Dr. Ash Buchanan, who I introduced previously. Now, just before you start, guys, I want to say a huge thank you to you for doing this. We're really grateful that you've given up your time free of charge for the benefit of our audience and the Church's Conservation Trust. Um, I'm really fascinated to hear what you've got to say. And anyone ever, who's anybody always loves a trip to Nantwich. So over to you guys. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. I'll just share slides if you could let me know if you can see that. Great. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. For those of you who don't know, a Vault is an arch ceiling construction that's usually made from stone, but sometimes made out of wood. So we'll be discussing our findings in relation to Nantwich St. Mary Church. So our collaboration began between Alex and I in 2014 after successful academic matchmaking via a colleague. And we were joined by J.R. Peterson. JR is a senior technician in the School of History, Languages and Cultures, also at the University of Liverpool. And early on in the project, we received funding from the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art to produce a digital survey of the medieval vault at Wells Cathedral. And this funding also allowed us to do a pilot study at Nantwich St. Mary, as well as Chester Cathedral. So it was on Friday the 13th of November 2015 that we went in to laser scan Nantwich St. Mary. And our analysis of the data at Nantwich uh, has become a significant case study to our project and it's written about extensively in our book which was published uh, at the end of June so in 2018, we were very lucky to receive a grant of nearly a quarter of a million pounds from the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which allowed us to extend the project. And uh, it enabled us to add Dr. James Hilson, crucially to the project, who uh, helped us with writing the book, and Dr. Sarah Duffy, who led on archiving all of our digital data, so it's freely available to the public. And as you can see here, this is a list of all of the sites that we visited. So why are we investigating medieval vaults? Well, the name which Peter mentioned, uh, Professor Robert Willis, who Alex has previously studied and written a book about. Pro Professor Robert Willis in 1841, he gave a lecture to the newly established Institute of British Architects, later the Royal Institute of British Architects. And in this lecture, he outlined his theories on how vaults were designed and constructed. And he based his findings mainly on accessible vaults, such as cloisters, which are relatively low to ground level, as well as destroyed vaulting, such as parts of Canterbury Cathedral. And I've just highlighted now at the bottom, uh, the left-hand image, uh, which shows the elevation of an east cloister bay at Norwich, which is accessible to Willis at just four metres above floor level at its apex. Note as well, I've added people here for scale. Many vaults are much higher than those in the cloister of Norwich, though. For example, in the chancel at Nantwich, which we'll talk about today, they're approximately 11 metres above floor level. And in the nave at Exeter, 
they're around 20 meters high. And finally, our biggest example, the Lantana Ely, which is a whopping 44 meters above floor level. So many bolts are therefore inaccessible, uh, and they were inaccessible to Willis. And he used this talk in 1841 as a call to architects to give him more data. So if architects were going to erect scaffolding inside of these churches and cathedrals, he was requesting that measurements be taken and information recorded for him to for him to study. However, this didn't really happen. He had one response from Charles Barry. Also, we have to think about the accuracy of previous scholarship. This is questionable because of use of analog techniques. Digital tools are much more accurate, which we'll come on to. So 180 years later, we still don't fully understand how medieval vaults were designed. But we now do have the technology to help us. And as I said, this comes in the form of digital surveying tools, which are fast and extremely accurate. I'll now hand back to Alex and she can give some more information about folks in Paris churches and language. Thanks, Nick. So as you may have identified from our map, we've scanned at a number of parish churches. And this slide shows us in action using Total Station, one of the recording methods, at Tewkesbury. However, Tewkesbury is only a parish church as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries. It was originally a wealthy Benedictine abbey, and this accounts for its size and the splendour of its vaults. And this accounts for the vast majority of vaulted parish churches, including Pershaw, which was one of our case studies, where the former monastic choir is now the parish church, and Malmesbury, where the parish retained the vaulted naves. Another of our case study sites, Ottery St Mary, was originally a collegiate church, staffed by canons, as well as serving the local parish. Both for reasons of cost and a sense of architectural hierarchy meant that very few parish churches were vaulted throughout, as we find at St Mary Redcliffe in Bristol. The majority of vaults found in parish churches are located in the porch, under the tower or in a chantry chapel, as we've just seen at Evesham, or very occasionally in the choir as a church font. And at Nantwich, we have both choir and a possible chantry chapel vault. Another example of a parish church, which is at least partially vaulted, is the church we're going to be talking about today, St Mary Nantwich in Cheshire. The church is very largely undocumented, so its architectural history is very reliant on archeological evidence. The church was founded not as a parish in its own right, but as a chapel of ease to nearby Acton, enabling Nantwich residents to attend services more locally. Both the churches were in the patronage of Combermere Abbey, meaning that the vicar was appointed by the monastery. The church as it stands was built in the late 13th century, but has been substantially reworked on the same foundations. Its ambitious scale, you can see it has transepts, could possibly be attributed to patronage by Robert Burnell, Bishop of Bath and Wells and Chan Chancellor of England. Rebuilding started in around 1340 with the rebuilding of the chancel and the extension of the north transept, but was probably halted by the Black Death in the years around 1347 to 8 and only recommenced in around 1380. The completion process may have been very protracted, and not completed until the early 15th century. And so we wanted to know what our data could add to understanding of the church. Given that the vault was obviously the last part of the chancel to be completed, we wanted to understand the relationship between the existing architecture and the vault's design. Next, we wanted to know how the vault might have been designed in both two and three dimensions. Then we wanted to know how the design related to other 14th century vault designs. Finally, when construction broke off in around 1350, the vault of the north transept was left unfinished but for the springing stones. And we wanted to know whether these could be used to work out the intentions of the original designer. But first we needed to decide how we would capture the data we needed to answer these questions. And I'll hand back to Nick for this. Thanks, Alex. So for the project, we tested three different methods of digitally surveying the vaults, and we'll talk through each of the three in a bit more detail. So the first is total station. And the way that total station works is that you look through a viewfinder, 
you point to a subject that you want to record and guided by a laser, you then press the side of the machine and it gives you an X, Y, Z coordinate in space. So you have to then repeat this process, almost like a dot to dot, uh, to be able to get the geometry that's required. And you can see an example of that in the center here. This is from the chapter house at Chester Cathedral. So the advantage of total station is that the data is precise and selected. You're only recording what is required. But at the same time, this can be a disadvantage because you need separate campaigns to record all the other elements. For example, the infill webbing. Another disadvantage, you don't get any color data from it. It's literally points in space and they're just black points. Also, the scanning times can be quite long. Alex and I have found that it takes us usually close to two hours to scan a single volt bay. So at this stage, we abandoned total station as a, as a method of scanning. However, we can see its advantages in particular um, investigations, which we'll, we'll come back to in, in the future. So the next method that we looked at was laser scanning. So laser scanning can be seen as an advance on total station. So rather than recording an individual point that is selected by the user, the laser scanner records the distance between it and every single surface that it hits uh, in 360 uh, around it. So you basically record everything in the line of the sight of the scanner. Also, the scanner takes photographs at the end, so it can attribute color to each of those points. So the best analogy that we have is thinking about the laser scan data being a swarm of bees, but in the shape of a building. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of laser scanning? Well, an advantage is that the data is precise and all details of the vaults and wider interiors are recorded. For example, we're interested in the vault ribs and the infill webbing, etc. But we're also recording the elevations of the church interiors and the floors. Another advantage is that the process is relatively fast, so it takes between 10 and 30 minutes per scan, and we do one scan per bay. Disadvantages, you end up with very large files and you need a very powerful computer to be able to do anything with the data. And another disadvantage linked to that is that you need expensive software and hardware. Uh, it's around £50,000 as an investment. So the, uh, just to, before I move on, you can see here, these are some of the outputs that we get in the middle. So this is called an orthophoto. So it's a flattened view, a plan view of the vaults above. And we can also uh, create mesh models from that. And this is a detail of the Tadda charge. This is the, the bottom part of the bulk ribs where they converge together. And the third method that we used was photogrammetry. Uh, the way that photogrammetry works is hundreds of photos are taken using the digital camera from as many different angles as possible to ensure that all details are captured. And you can see here on the right, this is uh, our technician who I mentioned earlier, JR, uh, taking photos in the North Quiet Isle of Wells. And if you look carefully at his feet, he's being watched by the cathedral cat to make sure that we're not up to anything we shouldn't be doing. So photogrammetry, once you have all the photos that are required, you import them into a piece of software called Agisoft Metashape, or the software is available. And this processes them and is able to figure out their positions in space. Uh, the output from this is a 3D point cloud model, much like I explained with laser scanning. Uh, and this can be used to create ortho photos again, as well as mesh models. So it basically gives you the same outputs as a laser scan. And you can see the equivalent here in the center. Uh, if you compare it between the two slides. Advantages, photogrammetry is relatively inexpensive. You need a personal digital camera, a copy of Metashape, which is about 500 pounds. You can even do it using a phone camera as well. Advantages, you get high quality images. Disadvantage though, the quality of the, of the mesh and the point cloud can be poorer at uh, greater distances away, and I'll explain that now. So at this point, we weren't sure whether to move forward with laser scanning or photogrammetry. So 
Here's an example. This is Exeter Cathedral in the Lady Chapel, and this is the ortho photo produced using laser scanning. And looking at the image, we're very pleased with the result in terms of the geometry. It looks very accurate. The image itself, though, was possibly a little bit grainy. You can see that here in the blown up image on the right. And when we compare that to the photogrammetry equivalent, again, the geometry looks very good, but the image itself is far superior. So we're getting much better images from photogrammetry. And then we started to look at the details. So we looked at what would happen based on our research that we'll talk about later. If you took a cut through a column uh, using the point cloud data, and um, this was just about a height of one meter above floor level. So we could get quite close with the laser scanner and uh, to take photographs. So laser scan on the left, photogrammetry on the right, column cuts, we're getting good results for both of those. However, we start to see problems emerge, looking again at the, the Lady Chapel of Exeter, when we take the vaults above. So in this case, they're around 10 meters above us. Now we can see if we take a cut through a vault rib using laser scanning, it's recording that rib profile quite well, even though it's nearly 10 meters away. Whereas the photogrammetry equivalent is a lot poorer. So we're losing a lot of the detail there. So this really told us that moving forwards, laser scanning was going to be our primary method. And if it loads, hopefully you can see that. Here's a quick video. This is Alex, JR and I in the uh, chancel at Nantwich, uh, scanning the vaults. Alex is talking to the public. Uh, JR is taking photos for photogrammetry. And I have the most difficult job, which is to stand around looking like I'm doing nothing, but actually I'm um, making sure that no one trips over the scanner and also ensuring that um, the tripod isn't knocked because that then affects the scan and we have to run it again. Okay, so the next thing we do, so we've now decided on laser scanning as our primary method. We've been to the site, we've collected that data, normally one scan per bay. The next thing we have to do is something called registration. So the way it works is uh, once you input the information into the software, that software called Farocene is able to calculate either using targets, so you can put up targets or, or spheres, which are essentially giant ping pong balls, and then the software can work out the position in space of each scan uh, based on that. Uh, since we started the project, the technology has, has moved forward a lot. We don't even need targets anymore. It can just look at geometry in the church and work out how to align the different scans to each other. So you can see here, different colors represent different scans and you can see how they overlap with each other to create a much fuller uh, model. So here you can see, these are some of the early outputs from Nantwich in, in which we took 11 different scans. So we didn't need that many because it's not a large space. And, and these are the initial uh, point cloud ortho photos. So images that don't have any perspective, which are really useful when you're studying vault geometry, because as you can see on the bottom, it gives you a very good visual understanding of, of how that works in plan. And likewise above, you get the same thing, but in section. The next output is uh, mesh models. We tend to use mesh models over point clouds because these are surface based. So um, point clouds are quite ghostly, like a, a swarm of bees, as we mentioned earlier, whereas a mesh is solid. So we find this easy to work with. Uh, the mesh is essentially a series of triangles that then create surfaces. And as I've zoomed in here, you can then start to see all of those different triangles. Okay, so now we've got our data ready to start analysis. So our work relies heavily on tracing intradus lines, hence the, the project name, Tracing the Past. And intradus line is the outermost edge of a vault rib. And this would have been the point that sat on the timber centering. So you can see an example in the image bottom right of timber centering. So this is the formwork that would have been in place that allows the stone ribs to then be placed over the top, build those ribs, and then knock out the centering and hope that it all stays up, essentially. So that junction between the two, the intradus line, is really critical for us to understand the geometry, as I said. 
And here's an image of a, a modern example of timber centering uh, at Notre Dame. So after the fire, uh, they were a bit worried about the buttressing uh, you can see here in the East End. So they actually reinstated some of the timber centering, which is really beautiful to see. So as I said, with that mesh model, we then trace along those intradus lines. So you can see an example of that in 3D in the center. We can also project out from that a sectional view and a plan view using the software, which is called Rhinoceros 3D. So at this stage, we've now got traced lines and we can then start to think about what we do with that trace data. The first thing we do is create best fit arcs because the original tracings aren't necessarily a true arc. So by creating a best fit arc, that then enables us to extract geometry such as the radius. But we're looking at these specific pieces of geometry. So we're looking for the impost line, and this is the point on which the springing point of a rib appears to rest, and it's usually the abacus of a capital in medieval vault. We're looking for the springing point, and that's the lowest level of the rib where it departs from the underlying supports, and this is almost always a fixed point in our research. We also have the notional apex. This is the highest level of the rib, and it's usually covered by a boss stone. But using the 3D modeling software, we can work out where the notional uh, point is by extending arcs beyond the boss. We have, as expected, the radius of each rib, and in some of our sites, we have multiple radii. And we have the arc center point in relation to the impost line. And this is the vertical distance between the arc center and the impost level, and it's usually discussed in terms of being on, above, or below it. So you can see here, that's the center point in relation to the impost line. In this example, it sat perfectly on the impost line. But as I've said, at some of our sites, we find that this can sit above or below it. So I'll just conclude this section by showing you a quick video, this time of Ely. Uh, this is the North Quiet Isle. So this is us tracing a rib along the intravus line, uh, this time manually. We've kind of moved on from this when we can, and we have an automated process now. But we're essentially trying to go as close to, to that center line as possible, which gives us a trace line, which you'll see shortly when the mesh is switched off. You can see a bit of a Blue Peter moment for those who know Blue Peter in the UK. Um, you know, here's a few that we've traced earlier. Um, but the one that we've just completed on screen now, we're now highlighting. Uh, the reason we're highlighting is, it, it is so that we can use a command called uh, circle bit point or something to those words. You see it on screen now. So the software is building a circle based on the points uh, that were created using that traced line. You can see now on the right hand window, we've got this circle in place. The next thing we do is we tidy up that data, we trim it. Uh, you can see here it's been trimmed below the impost line shown in green, and we're trimming it at the top of the notional apex as well. And now we have that information, we can start to populate a data table. So we do this for all of our sites. Uh, those key pieces of geometry that I outlined in the previous slide, we can then record. So I've highlighted the rib in question, and I'm now asking the software to tell me what the radius is of that rib. And I can then copy and paste that information into a data table, see here. And we do the same thing, not just for the radius, we also do it for the impost distance, so the, the center of that arc in relation to the impost, and you'll see us now uh, finding out where that is. In this example, it's quite far below, almost a meter below, which is quite rare. We put that back into the data table, and we do the same again for the apex height. So I'll, I'll just finish that one now, if I can, if it will let me. And I will hand over to Alex to give a bit more background on the anatomy of the vault and the 2D design process at Nanwich. Thanks, Nick.
Before we start analysing data, I think it'd be useful to look at the anatomy of a vault so we all know what, we, what it is we're looking at. A Gothic vault um, has two main elements, the webs and the ribs. The webs or surface of the vault were usually constructed from coarse masonry and plastered. In the Middle Ages, the webs would usually have been decorated with frescoes, as we still find in Italy, remains of which survive in some English vaults, such as those at Lincoln Cathedral shown on the slide. The ribs are the mouldings which usually mark changes in plane of the webs, but could also decorate planar surfaces. The ribs were built first as a framework and the webs were added afterwards, but both elements are important to the structure of the vault. Medieval vaults are not like modern steel frameworks infilled with no, non-load bearing panels. If you could cut a section through a vault, as we can do visually in a ruined vault, such as that at Melrose Abbey in Scotland, you'd be able to identify the stages of its construction. After the ribs and webs were erected, the pockets behind the bundles of ribs were filled in, and the whole structure was usually coated with a layer of concrete-like substance. The starting point of a rib is called its springing, and the top is called the apex. At the apex, where a rib meets another rib, there's usually a sculpted boss. The bosses at Nantwich are very beautiful and can be examined using a mirror on a trolley, which the church has helpfully provided. Architectural historians have given ribs different names based on their location. The wall ribs mark the junction with the wall, and the transverse rib spans between the side walls, marking the division between bays. So these are the ribs that outline the bay. A bay is a compartment of vaulting. And in the chancel vault at Nantwich, there are three essentially similar bays. Diagonal ribs cross the bay diagonally, and ridge ribs run along the crown of the vault, either east-west, the longitudinal ridge rib, or north-south, which is the transverse ridge rib. Additional ribs, which spring from the corners of the bay and rise towards the ridges, are called tiercerons. And those which don't start at the corner of the bay but start from another rib are called liernes. A complex vault, like that at Nantwich, has all these elements. We well, believe from our research overall that medieval architects started to design a vault for, by creating a plan of the ribs in two dimensions. This was laid out full scale on a flat plaster surface called a tracing floor. Very few of these tracing floors survive, although they are recorded in building accounts, and we've been lucky enough to be allowed to scan the tracing floor which survives at Wells Cathedral. From our data, we can create absolutely accurate two-dimensional representations of the vault, from which we can start to hypothesise the process used to devise the plan. We know that the drawing tools available to medieval designers were limited. Their main tool was a set of dividers or compasses from which they could create curves. They also had squares for creating angles and straight edges for drawing straight lines. Any design process we suggest therefore has to be possible using only these basic technologies. As a reminder, our process of tracing the curvatures of the ribs enables us to create absolutely accurate two-dimensional representations of the vault, as you just saw in the previous slide. We use this as a representation of the medieval tracing floor and seek to understand how it might have been laid out. And the first stage was to lay out the plan of a single bay. At Nantwich, the plan of the chancel bays was established by the pre-existing church. It was laid out with using what has been termed the medieval golden section. This starts with a square whose sides are the lengths of the short side of the bay and are extended to form the long sides of the bay whose length is yet to be established. The square's diagonal is drawn and this diagonal becomes the radius of an arc which is swung to meet the extended sides of the square. This process is repeated on the other side the points of intersection between the arc and the sides of the bay are therefore established and joined to create the missing side of the bay. If the shorter side of the bay is drawn as the edge of a square, the diagonal of the square is therefore the length of the longer side. As you can see, the auron, as this type of rectangle has been termed, matches the plan of the Nantwich chancel bays very closely. The next stage of the process is to locate the ribs. We believe this may have been done using a figure known as the star cut. 
And this again starts with the plan of the bay. First, two adjacent corners are located and the opposite midpoint, which can be found using compasses with the technique known as the perpendicular bisector. And these points are then joined to create a chevron. Then the process is repeated in the other direction. And again, upwards and downwards, finally creating an eight pointed star. And this is what we call the star cut. The star cut could be used to divide the bay into proportions in both directions, in halves, in thirds, in quarters, in fifths, as well as more complicated divisions, such as sevenths, again, in either direction, or elevenths. Once one fraction is found, it can be transferred along the length of the bay's sides using compasses. We found the star cut, or another equivalent proportioning device, in use at other sites. Its benefit was that it enabled a design to be transferred between bays using proportions rather than measurements. This was vital because medieval churches were rarely constructed to the same accuracy as our scans. So any design had to be sufficiently flexible to be applied to bays of slightly different sizes. In the absence of accurate numerical measuring devices, using proportions would have been much simpler. The star cut could be used to divide a four-sided bay into any fractional proportion up to one hundredths. And so far we found thirds at Lincoln Cathedral, sixths at Wells Cathedral, ninths at Exeter Cathedral, as well as fifths, again at Lincoln, sevenths at Wells, and thirteenths at Ely. So let's now see how the star cut might have been used to lay out the design of the Nantwich Chancel Bay. So here's a reminder of how the Chancel Bay was laid out. And here it is with the star cut added. First, the opposite midpoints are located divide the bay in half. Then the other midpoints of the bay sides are located to divide the bay in half in the other direction. Next, we find opposite corners and add a diagonal. And then the two other opposite corners to give the other diagonal. Next, we need to create some further setting outlines based on the intersection between the diagonals and the star cut chevrons. A pair of parallel lines is added, first in one direction, and then in the other. And then the midpoints are located and joined to create a diamond shape. And now we have all the basic setting outlines required and can start to add ribs. The edges of the bay are demarcated by wall ribs along the shorter sides, the junction with the wall, and transverse ribs, which form arches across the chancel. Next, the diagonals are added and then the ridge ribs. As we'll see later, the east-west ridge rib is horizontal and marks the apex of the vault, but the north-south ridge rib has a more complex three-dimensional form, but in 2D, it looks like a straight line. The tiercerons are located using the star cut, and the junctions between the tiercerons and the diagonals and our parallel setting outlines dividing the bay into thirds locate some of the leones and the other leones are located using the diamond shape. Finally, using the intersection between the diagonals and the diamond, we create another pair of setting outlines, and these locate the final set of leones. Now we have a hypothesis for the two-dimensional design of the vault, and overlaying it with our traced lines shows a really good fit. And here it is laid over our ortho photo, again showing a really good fit. And we're confident in this design. The similarity between their plans has been used to suggest a relationship between the chancel vault of Nantwich and the vaults of the side aisles of Wells Cathedral. It's believed that the designer of Nantwich may have known or copied the Wells design, but our research suggests that it's just as likely that the two designs evolved independently because they were using the same set of design principles, which we found in use at so many sites. And I'll now hand back to Nick to talk through how the design was projected into three dimensions. Thanks, Alex. So once the two-dimensional design had been established, the designer had to work out how to make it three-dimensional. 
When interrogating the uh, design processes involved, we work from the basic principle that the three-dimensional form of bolts at this period is dependent on five different factors. We've got the two-dimensional pattern of the ribs, which Alex has just explained. We have the height at which the ribs spring, known as the impasse, the height of the apexes of the ribs, the radius of the ribs, and the position of the center of the arc of the rib. Each of these factors could be used as a starting point, which limits the options available for the others. So if you have four of the five factors, the fifth one automatically follows. And some of these elements could be fixed by the pre-existing architecture. For example, you'll recall that the bay length and widths were based on the route to rectangle, the medieval golden section. Our data showed us that this was also true for the bay's height, meaning that this concept may have determined the height of the vault. Alternatively, though, the height could have been supported, uh, sorry, supplied by the apex of the east window that you see on the right, which might itself have been fixed by the medieval golden section's proportions. So looking at one rib, the transverse rib, uh, we know the following things. We know the length of the rib in 2D, which you can see highlighted in black here. We know the location on the plan of the springing point and the apex. Springing point shown in blue, apex shown as a black cross. Switching to three dimensions now, looking at an elevation, we know the height of the apex, which is shown as a green cross here. We've also identified from our research that medieval designers preferred where possible to locate the center of the ribs curvature on the impost line, such that it often became a fixed point. And this is true uh, for the example we're showing here, the transverse rib at Nantwich. And therefore, the unknown element is the radius of the rib. So the other elements are already confirmed. We need to now find out the unknown radius. So working from these known elements, the radius could be found by what we've termed the chord method. So this is how the chord method works. First, we draw a line between the springing point and the apex. Then we draw a line at a right angle uh, to the first line, halfway along its length. And the point at which this line crosses the impost line is the position of the center. And the distance between this point in the springing and this point in the apex gives us the radius. And this is what we find for the transverse ribs at Nantwich. So the way that Alex and I work is we'll test this as a hypothesis. And then we have that original, uh, original geometric data that we can then compare with. So we had a really good result here that we were quite happy with. And we then repeat this for all of the other ribs. And here you can see the three dimensional hypothesis, and there it is overlaid with the original trace data. So we'll finish the talk just to talk for five or 10 minutes about the North Transept Vault, which is quite a different case study for us based on the rest of our research. So this vault in particular is either partially constructed or perhaps partially destroyed, and it's from the 14th century. And what we see in the north transept are springing stones, this is where the individual ribs spring from, that remain in the bay. Likewise, we can see the bounding wall arches of the vault. So we therefore wanted to investigate if we could postulate simulations of the intended design using the existing architecture and contemporary examples from the time. So when we're dealing with missing architecture, transparency of method is particularly important when suggesting what a vault may have looked like. So if we're presenting to the public or fellow researchers what we think this vault uh, may have been like in terms of its design, we need to say our levels of confidence, essentially. And uh, we have worked on uh, some previous scholarship by the likes of Karen Kenzek and Mike Masouche uh, and, and kind of adopted their methods for this. So we have a traffic light system where green indicates deductions made directly from the built architecture. Amber indicates analogies that have been derived from secondary sources such as contemporary architecture. And red indicates the uh, assumptions that we've had to make because we know that there has to be something there as a piece of architecture, but we don't have any evidence to substantiate it. 
In addition to these three colours, we also have blue, which indicates primary evidence, so the actual uh, inbuilt architecture. And finally, we're using purple in this example to show our traced data. So here you can see showing purple, the traced ribs in the boat. And we essentially see the, the wall ribs around the outside and these very short traced lines of the, the start of the Springer stones that would then kind of continue out in, in some way. So just to familiarize yourself, uh, the left two images are elevations, the third one along is a plan, and the one to the right is a isometric view, a three-dimensional view. So once we have this trace data, we can then extend out the lines. So we can see here, we start to get a hint of what that vault might have looked like. So we'll talk through the 2D process first. So looking at the plan in detail, we can hypothesize a 2D design process, similar to that discussed by Alex in the chancel. So we start with the bounding bay, which includes the bounding wall ribs. Uh, then we have the diagonals then the ridge ribs, and then we join, uh, we draw two chevrons across the bay by joining a bay corner to the opposite midpoint, then back to the other corner on that side of the bay. And this gives us our first hypothesis of how the bay may have been planned out. And we can see this hypothesis overlays uh, with the traced extended lines. But we weren't 100% confident about this result. You can see here, there's not a very good correlation, uh, particularly with the intermediate ribs, the tier cerums. So we wanted to have uh, a go at something else. Before I talk through that though, you can see here the levels of confidence. We have green, uh, these ribs are very confident that we've got these right, but orange has been used where we're less confident. So moving on to the second option, here we see the original traced lines. And just like last time, we add the diagonals and the ridge ribs using the same process. However, instead of using chevrons, we're instead using uh, circles with their centers at the midpoint of the wall ribs. And where the circle across the ridge rib shown as red dots here, this gives us our missing apex. And using this, we can add the intermediate ribs or tiercerins in plan. So here we can see the new hypothesis again overlaid with the traced extended lines. And we get a much closer result in this option. In terms of our levels of confidence in the data, we've still kept the intermediate ribs as uh, orange, amber, uh, because of the fact that we're not 100% certain that they're correct, although we do believe that this option uh, is closer to what it would have been than the first one, as you can see here. So moving forward into 3D, we went with option two. So moving on to the 3D process, to recap, these are the trace lines of the in situ elements of the vault extended to their apexes. And we start the 3D hypothesis by adding war ribs, which are known elements as they still exist in the bay. Next, we can add the diagonal ribs, as we're very confident of their positions in plan, and the central apex. Similarly, we're confident that the shorter transverse ridge rib is correct, given the existence of the start of these ribs in the bolt, and then need to meet the diagonal at the centre of the bay. So for the first 3D option, we hypothesized that the longitudinal ridge rib was horizontal, given the similarity between apex height for tiercerins uh, at 3.56 meters, diagonal ribs at 3.3 meters, and transverse wall ribs at 3.53 meters. A horizontal uh, longitudinal ridge rib is therefore uh, used between the central apex of the bay and the tiercerin apex. And consequently, the longitudinal ridge rib between the tiercerin apex and longitudinal wall arch apex has to curve downwards considerably. So hopefully you can see that here. And this contradicts the existing built fabric. Here we can see uh, highlighted in, in red and, and ringed as well. Uh, we can see the start of the ridge ribs in the north transept. And we believe that these are, um, given the existing architecture, these have to be projected either horizontally or near horizontally. So essentially, this means that option one uh, isn't viable. 
So we therefore moved on to a second option. And this one assumes a near horizontal long longitudinal ridge rib, uh, which has a, a shallow curvature to it. So you can see this is the main difference here. It now has the shallow curvature. And we have support for this. So we can see this being used in the chancel of Nantwich itself. Uh, we also see a similar design being used in the Lady Chapel at Ely and the nave at Worcester and the Lady Chapel at Lichfield. So option two could be viable. So for the final option, we instead tested a horizontal longitudinal ridge, which becomes curved as it reaches the geometry of the tear cylinders, which finally becomes curved as it, uh, sorry, uh, the longitudinal ridge rib therefore needs to be designed to incorporate this new lower apex. So you can see here, this new lower apex. And this suggests the vault may have taken a tunnel form. And like option two, we have a lot of support for this in contemporary uh, vaulting. So we see uh, the choirs at Wells and Gloucester. We also see the nave at Tewkesbury and Ottery. Given the evidence presented above, we're most confident in option three, particularly as on reflection, the start of the ridge ribs that exist in situ all appear to be horizontal, not near horizontal. And finally, uh, we'll just quickly show you how we disseminate this research. So we have 3D models online. And if we were to give you this talk in person, we'd be handing out these 3D models that we made. So we use a 3D printer and we were able to then show each of these three options that we think we use in the more transept at Nambridge. And they then slot into the space where they would have been built. Okay, I will now hand back to Alex for some concluding remarks. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, so if you want to see more about our research, um, please go to our website, tracingthepast.org.uk. Um, you can also subscribe to our biannual newsletter. You can either do that by sc scanning the QR code or follow the link, um, which I don't know whether we have a chat function um, in Facebook, but if George could put the link there, that would be great. Um, you can also see our book, um, Digital Analysis of Vaults in English Medieval Architecture, which as Nick mentioned, was published earlier in the summer by Routledge and it's available, we hope, from all good bookshops. Um, we'll be continuing our research. So although the funded project is now over, um, we have so much data to be getting on with. I think it'll be the rest of our careers um, still analysing um, what we've got. So do, do follow us and we will keep you updated with, with new findings as they emerge. Um, but we're very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you, Nick, um, for your fascinating um, presentation there. I know a lot of people have already been commenting away with um, questions and yes i've got the link and everyone i will shortly be posting um a link into the chat um as well as on the event page on facebook so after this lecture if you um catching up you'll be able to find the link also on the event page on facebook um so i'm going to dive straight in with some of the questions that have been coming if that's okay so question one um, this is for Nick. Um, Nick, do you know about um, terahertz imaging done at Moorville Church by the University of Reading, where they can look inside walls? Sorry, where they can look inside walls? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at that. Um, terahertz imaging. Uh, we uh, the, the closest we've got is starting to think about technology to look under the surface of the tracing floor at Wells. Um, but no, we, we've essentially not used any, um, any digital tools yet that actually look inside of walls. Um, but that's, that's really fascinating. And um, another question that's sort of tied to how you capture images, as someone's asked them, have you tried photogrammetry with a drone and optical image stabilization? Well, I mean, can you imagine if we went to the church's conservation trust and said, can we fly a drone inside one of your beautiful churches? Don't worry, we, we won't bang into anything. Um, it, it's one of those. It's, it, 
Yeah, it's a really good suggestion to, to use a drone, but I don't think we're confident enough that we, you know, the risk basically of using a drone could be pro problematic. Although I have seen um, examples of drones which are kind of contained in a sphere. So if they do hit something, they kind of bounce off, which is quite useful. We have spoken to uh, people in the past, essentially about using a, a, a very long pole, a tripod, which allows you to mount a camera about 10 meters in the air. So that's another option as well. Thanks, Nick. And I suppose this next question is really for Alex. Um, do we know if tracery was designed in, in a particular way um, because of religious principles or beliefs? Um, I'm not an expert on, am I unmuted? Yes, I'm not an expert on tracery. We know that um, tracery was probably used using the same geometrical systems as um, vaults and our data will enable us to look at tracery at a later stage if we if we want to I mean or if anybody's interested in, in tracery do um, go to the archaeological data service and download our data because as Nick mentioned we've captured windows as well as vaults. Um, there are some examples where it looks as though the tracery and the stained glass were designed together and the stained glass obviously has um, religious significance because it's got iconography, it's, it's got imagery in it. And so the tracery matching the, Im the um, imagery, they must have been considering what was going to go into it in order to design it. Um, we haven't found any correlation between um, sacred numbers and vault designs as yet. So it's something that we are aware of. We're not dismissing it out of hand, but we've not found anything that, that suggests that they are using particular geometries for particular religious reasons. But if you were to do that, um, almost any number can be given religious significance. So it's quite difficult to say, well, they use thirds because of the Holy Trinity, because you know, fourths would also do something, fifths would also do something. So it's quite difficult to analyze um, in that way. And I suppose that this kind of, that answer fits in quite nicely with another question that's coming is that, does the star cut have anything to do with the star of Bethlehem or the star of David, do you think? I don't think so. I think it, it's it's purely a proportioning device. Um, so we found other styles of star cut, which also look like stars, but they pr produce different proportions. Um, so I think I think it's a convenience thing, though we can't. One of the things that we cannot possibly reconstruct is the conversations that happened between the master mason and the patrons. And it's entirely possible that if you're trying to convince um, a wary patron and you know the patron has strong religious beliefs that you might use this, but I don't think from the point of view of the, the Masons, um, that's foremost in their minds, no. And with the vaults you've shown, um, it, there's clearly, um, looking at different cathedrals in different regions, there's similarities that can be seen. Have you discovered therefore that there's a regional style of vaults in different parts of the country and by, that by extension, can we then define there's a English regional style of vaulting? We chose the vaults that we use for our case studies partly to test those sort of questions. So we know that there are some commonalities, for example, in the Southwest and quite a lot of our vaults are in the Southwest, this sort of tunnel style of vaulting um, with lateral penetrations. We find it at Wells, we find it at Gloucester, we find it in Ottery St. Mary. But we've done a recent article that will be coming out next year, looks in detail um, at the um, choir vault of Wells and the choir vault of Ottery St. Mary, which visually look very similar and in three dimensional terms are quite similar, but the geometries are quite different. Um, they've used the star cut in very different ways. So um, although there are, there are similarities, um, it's not being done in exactly the same way. So it's not as clear a fit as I think we'd hoped to find. It's more complex than we, we had initially imagined. And due to the skills that would be needed to build these um, um, engineering marvels in some ways, do you think these workers would have traveled around? Would they have, you know, the people who built the parish church vaults, would they have done cathedrals? And would there be in continental movement? So would we have had French builders coming over to England or vice versa, do you think? 
We think yes, um, but we need much more evidence. So that's something that we're really looking forward to doing more collaboration with. There are lots of um, researchers on the continent who are doing the same sort of research as us. Um, and we're looking forward to having more conversations. We've already started having conversations with them where we can share data to try and see the sort of um, parallels that you're talking about. Um, but research, existing research has already shown that Masons who worked on cathedrals may also have designed parish churches. Um, so that's already known. Our, our data doesn't add anything specific to that, but, um, but we're, yeah, it's, it's, it's work in progress. It's one of the many things that we want to look at um, as, we, as we develop our research over the coming years. I don't know, Nick, have you got anything? I, I feel as though I'm, in, um, kind of hold oh, no, that's... interrupt please do <laughs> and um, uh, Nick I don't know if you want to answer this question but um, are there any known examples where geometry was physically or theoretically flawed and as a result the vault failed trial and ever error must have been a risky business well, if you can think of any Alex and there, there are quite a few instances where the vault fails but obviously we don't have the vault now if it fell down we don't have it so it's quite difficult to know what made it go wrong mm. um so so that one's a difficult one i mean we don't know whether at nantwich it was one that failed i think it's unlikely because it's quite such a small it's such a small vault um one of our um, kind of research questions um, one of the things that informs our analysis is the extent to which um, vaults have settled so the vaults that we've got whether the geometry we're getting from them is the intended geometry so far we think it is because we haven't found um, if a vault had settled I'm going to be walls here so if a vault had settled um, too much the walls should have pushed out a bit and we're finding our walls are still very vertical so we don't think there's been too much settlement but there are instances at Wells Cathedral um, in the side aisles there. At some point, somebody has been worried about those because they put some metal tie beams in to try and um, sort out something that they thought was going wrong. They're quite historic. They're not, um, they're not a modern um, introduction. So at some point in the, in the past, somebody thought there was a problem, but we don't have any evidence there actually was. And I suppose the final question to finish with um, is, do you think um, looking at medieval vaults in the way that you're doing has something that can teach modern architects and modern engineers about how we can construct buildings today and in the future? I think that one's probably one for you, Nick, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you do see, ex again, colleagues out in Spain, Santiago Huerta, I believe, worked with some big architects. I think it was Foster and Partner to, to kind of show the principles of bolting and how that could be used in a modern way you get some very some amazing engineers people like Peter Rice who worked on arches you tend not to see them used as faithfully anymore so obviously the arches used in ribs they work in compression um, I think the, yeah, the it, techniques are very useful in conservation work um, mm -hmm. so it's much, much easier for the uh, masons who are working on the restoration of Notre Dame after the fire to be able to rebuild the vault because they've got good laser scans. So they can understand, they know what was there before and they can reproduce it exactly if they want to. Um, but it's been more from our point, our, our research's point of view, it's been more that techniques that are being used by modern architects to design buildings, we can then use to analyze buildings. Mm -hmm. So Nick's done some wonderful research with, with parametrics that's used by Zaha Hadid and, and other architects to design buildings, but we can use it to analyse buildings. Fantastic. And I mean, thank you so much for um, your answers there. And everyone, thank you so much for your questions today. Um, they've been really interesting. And um, as I said, I've posted a link to um, the website as well as to um, uh, Nick and Alex's book. So please do have a look at those if you'd like um, extra resources but if you've got any questions do send me a, a message and I can try and put you in touch and if, um, if I've missed anything um, I'll put some more links out there but um, everyone thank you very much for joining. Now I've added this morning um, details of three 
um, upcoming lectures. I've got more lectures to put on, so I'm working my way through upcoming lectures. But next week, we're going to be joined by someone from the CCT, Brian Hoggard, who um, is involved with our project at St. Swithin's Worcester. Now, Brian is a folklore historian, um, and he's done a couple of lectures for us already. And he's going to be talking to you next week about concealed objects in churches, dead cats, witch bottles, and shoes. So join us at the same time next Thursday for that lecture. Now, um, Every year we hold a, a memorial lecture. It's um, in honor of a uh, former trustee of ours, Candida Lysett Green. And we hold that every year. Um, normally it's um, physically um, in a venue. Um, last year we had to hold, hold it digitally because of the COVID lockdown. This year, however, we are back um, doing a physical um, lecture in London. Um, and you can find details of that on our website. Um, the guest lecturer um, who's given our keynote talk at it is um, the author and historian Simon Heffer. Um, so you can find details of that through our website. And I should say that if you are a member of the CCT, there is an exclusive member rate um, for tickets for that, but I'll be going. Um, so if you want to come along and see me, um, I will be there. I'll be sending some books and some other goodies that you can buy from us at the Trust. Um, but it'd be great to see people come to that lecture. So if you've got any questions or would like to find details of that, I'll post a link on our chat where you can find details of that. Now, as we said at the start of the lecture, if you'd like to become a member with us, um, you can do so through our website. Um, if you join by direct debit and use the offer code lecture, you'll get a free copy of this book as well as other goodies and rewards. That's enough from me today, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and thank you again to Nick and Alex for a really interesting lecture and insight into vaults. Um, if you've got ideas for future lectures, please do comment away. But thank you so much everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next Thursday for another lunchtime lecture. <laughs>